What is very similar between John and Francis is that they grew up in two countries where the church was convinced that they had shaped the national and social political culture of their countries forever. It is to the idea of Christendom. The church is the soul of the national culture. And both Pope John and Pope Francis, at some point in their life, they realized how, uh, how complex that was in terms of how frail, of how compromised that Catholic culture was with other elements, with fascism in Italy in the 1920s, 30s for Pope John, for the future Pope John, um, and with the ideologies of authoritarianism in Argentina for Pope Francis. So here there are similarities. They wake up at some point and they notice some shortcomings or some uh, really uh, paradoxes in the Catholic idea of how the church should influence public life when they really hit the violence of this system, so I mean fascism and the generals uh, regime in Argentina that claim to be Catholic. That it, it is something that is very, very important. For example, uh, that happens also in the life of Pope Benedict in Nazi Germany. But what Pope Benedict says, just like most German Catholics, is that Nazis were the enemies of Christianity. They were not Christians. They were the enemies of Christianity, which is a very interesting way to distance yourself from. So this is something Italian fascists, the Italian Catholics have a harder time doing that. And in Argentina, you know, it was much, much, even more complicated. So they both, uh, reckon with the idea that um, Catholicism um, has some explaining to do, if you want, um, uh, about what happened to these Catholic countries that uh, it, uh, at some point became uh, very violent political regimes. There is another similarity that is in the middle of their careers, both the future Pope John and the future Francis, they struggle themselves with the, the difficult issue of how to update a certain way of being church in the modern world. And for Pope John in the 1940s, 50s, he, when he's at an apostolic nuncio in Paris, in France is the issue of, uh, of the worker priests. Uh, these priests want to work in factories. And for the young provincial of the Jesuits in, in, in Argentina, uh, how to deal with liberation theology. That's a very painful experience for both of them because that is a trauma for the French church in the 1950s um, and for the personal experience of Francis as a provincial of the Jesuits in 1970s Argentina. But this is something typical of their learning, how to be uh, a church leader in times um, of change. Uh, so they grow. We know that Pope John was not comfortable with the idea of, young, of Catholic priests working in factories. And we know that the young provincial of the Jesuits in Argentina was not uh, like, let's put it this way, uh, by the Jesuits. So they go through painful experiences not in the relationship between the church and the modern world, but painful experiences for them within the church. This is something very, very typical of, of both Pope, of Pope John and Pope Francis. One big difference is that Pope Francis is the first pope in a long, long time 
uh, who never studied and worked in Rome. Yeah, it's something very relevant for how he deals with Rome, with the Vatican. Uh, on the other side, the future Pope John studied in Rome as a young priest um, and worked in Rome when he was around 40 for the mission, uh, for, for the missionary activity of the Catholic Church. Uh, what is interesting is that in the biography of Pope John, he, he, his experience of Rome doesn't make him more clerical or more Rome oriented or more it, in Rome in the early 20th century 1902-1903 it's where he wakes up and he, he goes through a spiritual crisis um, and he becomes what he will be as Pope John. This is something very special. So usually we think that the Roman experience in young priests is, is not necessarily good. It may be good for their scholarship, for their culture, but not for their spirituality. That it's, it, it, it is part of the anti-Roman complex, which is part of the Catholic Church since I mean, way before Luther. It's not something that happens to Pope John, uh, and it's some. And here, Pope Francis he really l lives and knows Rome deeply only when he's elected Bishop of Rome. But there's not Pope, which is very unusual, very unusual. All the predecessors, either they were uh, uh, diplomats working in the Roman Curia. Or, to, or career officials, or that's not not what Francis goes through uh, in, uh, in in his life. A turning point for both of them is when they become bishops, when they are appointed bishops. Um, so we in our in our imaginary about the church, we tend sometimes to think that being appointed bishop is it's not something that makes you a free person in, in the Catholic Church. It makes you a bureaucrat, it makes you loyal to the institution, makes you, this is something that we all think more or less so whether we are of a certain persuasion, uh, theologically, or over another. For Pope John and Pope Francis, when they are appointed bishops, it's something that liberates them. It's some, so it calls them to be what they always wanted to be, which is pastors of the Catholic Church, and the real service of real people. So that happens... Um, uh, different stages. It, it happens for Pope, for the future Pope John when he is 72, 72. and it is and and regarded, regarded by many as a honorable retirement of this diplomat in Venice, which, which is a very strange, strange city. It's, it's, it is not a, a big city. It is a, 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 a big medieval village, uh, uh, sociologically speaking. Uh, but it's when he starts as the bishop, as, as the patriarch of Venice, this is the, 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 the patriarch of Venice, he starts doing things that are revelatory or something that will really uh, will show itself in, in full when he calls the Second Amendment Council. He starts inviting Catholics to uh, an ecumenical approach to other Christians. Um, he welcomes in 1956 the uh, National Convention of the Socialist Party in Venice. He tells them welcome, <laughs> which in Cold War Italy is something that shocks most Italian Catholics because socialist communists were supposed to go to hell, period. <laughs> no. um, 
Something very interesting, in 56, Northern East Italy received a lot of refugees from Hungary, where the Soviets had uh, re-established order, let's say that. And so Venice is one of the hotspots of the landing grounds for these refugees from Eastern Europe, something that he had done before uh, rescuing a few thousand Jews uh, in Turkey during World War II. Um, so this is it's the pastoral experience of Pope John. Um, he really invites Catholics in Venice to rediscover the scripture Bible, which is obvious for us today. But before Vatican II, Catholics were not supposed to read the Bible, really. It was considered dangerous, uh, not appropriate for non educated Catholics. A very similar thing you have with uh, Bishop Bergoglio, who in 1992, when he's 56, and he's considered a failure by most people who know him, a failed Jesuit, a failed provincial of the Jesuits. Um, uh, a number of, he's, he, he's considered a, a, a failed priest. And he's rescued by the Archbishop of Buenos Aires who appoints him uh, auxiliary bishop. And this is when we start to see the Bergoglio that we see today. A real pastor who, who really takes seriously the idea that being a bishop is not an honor. It's not being appointed bishop is not the ecclesiastical version of what that that sociologist many years ago, I remember his name, uh, says that at some point we all reach our level of incompetency. <laughs> That sometimes happens. With for Bishop Regoglio, that's exactly when he's born again as a pastor. That's one of the most remarkable things uh, because, uh, as you know, to be appointed bishop cardinal, uh, your CV, your your resume, should look in a certain way. His, his CV is full of incidents, is full of missteps, is full of, uh, of mistakes. Um, so this is something that is really, really interesting uh, about them. Uh, and it, it is a similarity. They both, both the future Pope John and the future Pope Francis have terrible relationship with the Vatican, the Roman Curia, terrible relationship. Uh, I've published the letter that Pope John sent, uh, the future Pope John sent to uh, to the Vatican when he was a diplomat in Eastern Europe. It's just terrible that it's, uh, besides the, the fact that they tell him in 1925, go to, to Bulgaria, but don't worry, you'll stay there for six months. You stay there for, for almost ten years, and, and they don't tell him what to do. I mean, it's it's so. Both of them, they, they have a very difficult relationship with the Vatican, and you can imagine what many people think when they are elected popes, because many of those with whom they had terrible relationship were still in the Vatican when they were elected popes. And so that's something very, very interesting, very, very complicated. Um, and uh, so there's one thing that is very interesting, and I tried to write something last year, uh, a short article uh, about that. There is, they have an, in their language, in their vision of the church, of the gospel of Jesus Christ, it's something that is much more shaped by uh, literature and by a, an understanding of human life in, in historical and, and poetic terms, much more than dogmatic. So I don't know if you have ever heard of 
this uh, Italian intellectual, Pierpaolo Pasolini. He was the one who, who probably uh, had the idea for the best movie ever on Jesus Christ, the, the Gospel according to Matthew, 1964. And so Pasolini was a communist was was openly gay in 1960s Italy and he dedicated that movie to Pope John. There is something in the way Pope Francis speaks that is exactly the language of poetry uh, of an existential uh, dimension. For example, it is strikingly similar the way Pasolini uh, looked at the peripheries in his time, the peripheries of Rome, especially, and the way Pope Francis talks about the peripheries. There are many, many similarities. And so you know that when he was a young teacher, Pope Francis uh, in Argentina uh, invited <coughs> to lecture his students, uh, Borges, the greatest Argentinian uh, author. So that, so there is a similarity, they don't think dogmatically. So they know the tradition of the church, but they don't think dogmatically. They think historically, they think poetically, they think existentially. So their imaginary, their vocabulary is very, very uh, different from other popes, I think. Um, and from, uh, from, the, from the previous tradition, um, especially. So, um, one thing that is similar, and here we should I mean, devote much more time to uh, the similarities between uh, the two conclaves that elect Pope John in 58 and Pope uh, Francis in 2013, the, 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 there are many similarities, and usually, so one usual and in its way, I mean, correct way to call the pontificate of Francis is a papacy of reform, which which is correct, but it's very incomplete. So what happens both at the conclave of fifty eight and of twenty thirteen? is that the church is institutionally a big mess. Scandals of all kinds. Uh, in 58, the scandal during the death and the funerals of Pope Pius, the, the, so something, I mean, in a sense, much worse than the scandals of over Vatican finances. So, I mean, the idea that many have is that the, the, the conclave of 58 and 2013, they should go back to order. And go back to a normal uh, way of the Catholic Church and especially of the, of, of the bureaucracy to work. And so this is, it is technically the platform they are elected. So when Pope John is, is, is elected, they all they assume that all he will do is to reappoint a Secretary of State, because the, uh, the Catholic Church had not had a Secretary of State for 14 years. I mean, 1944-58, the Catholic Church doesn't have a Secretary of State. Um, go back to... Uh, uh, to receiving cardinals in audience, I mean, to a normal system. And that happens. But they don't know that both these popes have a much, a much bigger plan. So here, what is really similar be, be between Pope John and Francis and their ecclesiologists is that they are reformers, yes, but the key word to understand the ecclesiology is not reform, because reform assumes that there is a pure form that at some point we had in the church, and we should go back to that. 